so much for coming and sharing with us the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, in the Holy Word. It's my honor to be up here again to share with you all the things that are written therein, and we are today going to be looking at chapter 4 in the book of Revelation. We have a lot to cover, so what I'm going to do is go into prayer, and then we are going to look at Revelation chapter 4. So let's pray together, okay? Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet here. We ask that your blessings would be given to this place as we're gathered together to hear your holy word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the ministry of the angels. May they be here to keep us from distraction. May our minds be clear. May we understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thank you for guiding us. And please do not trust me again with a single word before your people. This is your time, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So looking at Revelation chapter 4, we're going to go into verse 1, and notice what it says. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, so John is writing... He looks and sees a door. It's open in heaven. He hears a voice that talks to him. And this voice says, come up here. Come up higher. Come up where I am. And I will show you what's going to come. What's the last word there? Hereafter. Okay? So there's a door that's open. It's in heaven. He's told to come up. And there are things that are done hereafter. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 1 and verse 19. Remember it says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be, what? Hereafter, you see? So the Holy Bible says in chapter 1, verse 19, and in Revelation chapter 1, that there are things that are going to be hereafter. Remember, John was told to write the things which are, the things which were, and the things which are going to be. So there's a past, a present, and a future. What John is looking at here, interestingly, are future events from this point forward. Now, what I do know, but what I don't like, is that many churches today, many preachers will actually take the Word of God in the book of Revelation, and they will say that chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, is relevant for us today as a church. But everything after that is for hereafter. You see, they'll, they'll take the rest of the book of Revelation and kind of push it off into a future time that we don't really know when it's going to be, and so it's not relevant for us. I don't buy into that. I believe the Holy Bible is relevant for me right now, all the way through the Scripture, especially at the end of time. Now, there were times, of course, like in the book of Daniel, where in chapter 12, Daniel was told, hey, this book is for you at the end of time. And so I understand that there are portions of the Scripture at times where there are things relevant more than at others. And there are some prophecies that haven't been fulfilled even in the book of Revelation. But how much more relevant for us at the end of time when we are right ready to see these things fulfilling. So now, when it does say hereafter, it's talking about future events. But interestingly, what John does in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 and onward, he jumps back in time a little bit. We're not going to see that now, this time, but next time we're together, looking at chapter 5, we're going to see that it's actually dealing with something that happened in the past, even though he said, let's look at things hereafter. So it, you've got to know a little bit about the timing of the book of Revelation and the structure of the book of Revelation to be able to stand it, to be able to understand it better. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit now about what it says in verse 1, and then we'll continue in 2. There's this door opened in heaven. Now, remember in chapter 1, we talked a lot about what is uh, the language of the book of Revelation. The, the book of Revelation is couched in what kind of language? You remember? Sanctuary language. Remember Jesus in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, it's, to, it's talking about him with lots of sanctuary symbolism. And so here, when it talks about there's a door opened in heaven, I'm guessing, and we're going to look at this more in the future, but I'm guessing now, just from the sanctuary language we've already looked at from chapter 1 through 3, that we're talking about sanctuary language. So the door to the tabernacle is probably what he saw opened. 
the door of the, the sanctuary up in heaven. And just a side note, Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the door. Okay? Jesus is all over the book of Revelation. He said in John chapter 10 with his own, ver with his own mouth, recorded by John, the same author, I am the door. So when this door is open in heaven, even the door itself is symbolic of Jesus Christ. Jesus is there waiting for John to come up. Now, when he hears this voice up in heaven, and this voice was as a trumpet talking with him, we've heard this trumpet before, haven't we? In chapter 1 and verse 10, let's look at that very quickly. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me. It was a great voice. As of a what? trumpet. And so this trumpet speaks with John, but this trumpet actually ends up being who? Jesus. So remember, John turns around to see the voice. He didn't see the person. He saw the voice. The word is what he saw. It was the word Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus was the word that became flesh in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. So now when he hears this voice as of a trumpet, it's actually Jesus. Jesus says, hey, come up here. I want to show you something, things that will be after this. In verse 2 of Revelation 4, immediately I was, second time it's used, in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I think this is fascinating. Jesus is calling John higher. And what he sees, as soon as he gets into heaven, when he's in the Spirit, the first thing he sees is not God. You know, I would think, as a student of the Bible, and as, as important as God is up in heaven, I would think if I were to make something up about going into heaven, the first thing I would say coming back down to earth was, I saw God. Everybody would be like, oh! You know, you saw God. Well, no, 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 that's not what John does. John says, I was taken up into heaven, and I saw a throne. Like, what? You saw a throne? I mean, like, wasn't God there? Well, yeah, God was there, and he was on the throne, but the throne was so something marvelous. It was so, it must have been massive. It must have been noticeable. It was something so evident there that what he says is I saw a throne. Ah, interestingly, the word throne in the book of Revelation chapter 4 alone is used, guess how many times? You took too long, I'll tell you. Twelve times in this one chapter. Twelve times in this chapter. So I guess the question would be just by gathering the evidence of the, you know, the immediate context, what's the subject, what's the deal? Who is on the throne? Because these churches that he just heard about, they're going through ups and downs. There's persecution, there's death, there's deception, there's all these false teachings and doctrines. There's this woman called Jezebel that's teaching. All these crazy things are happening in the churches, but the very next thing he says is, hey, come up here, I want to show you something. It's a throne, and somebody is sitting on that throne. Who was it? It's God the Father. Why do I say God the Father? Well, it's next time that we're going to learn who comes in while God the Father is on the throne. Just to let you know, it's the Lamb. The Lamb is used 29 times in the book of Revelation. All 28 of those 29 times is talking specifically about Jesus. There's one time, though, the word Lamb is not talking about Jesus. And just to let you know, if you're curious, it's in chapter 13. Okay? So... God the Father is sitting here on the throne. You ever wondered, what does God look like? If your imagination caps are turned on today, we're going to get a little piece of what the Bible teaches in regard to what God the Father looks like. Okay? The Bible says in verse 2, we'll read it again. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, there are so many things I could go into, but like I said, there's a lot to cover, so we're going to skip some of the things that are left for you to continue to study. We can talk about kings, we can talk about Deuteronomy, we can talk about a lot of things 
from the Old Testament that will teach us about what a king does on the throne. But like I said, that's up to you. So now, verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. <laughs> now, if you ask me what God looked like, I would not have said he looks like jasper. Okay? I just wouldn't do it. I used to live in a town called Springfield, Oregon. And it was right next to Jasper, Oregon. And the reason why it was Jasper, Oregon is because there was a mountain there that used to be a mine. And you would go and you could take stones. In fact, I've, I took my family up there. We were digging through the stones of Jasper. And the Jasper, you could see, was some parts of it were clear, some parts like, kind of like an opaque stone. But uh, there was a lot of green, okay? I'm guessing, and I was told, that the green was actually some type of mineral that was coming and eating away some of the jasper, so it's almost like a tarnish, okay? And uh, I would imagine that the jasper is pure, right? So let's see what the Bible says the color of jasper is. Turn in your Bible to Revelation 21, and let's look at verse 11. The Bible says in verse 11, Have, this is talking about the holy city, having the glory of God and her, the city's light, was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Jasper, what does it look like? It's clear as crystal. Okay, wait a minute. Now, have you ever seen crystal before? Have you ever, you, you've held up crystal, haven't you? And when you hold it up, what can you do? You can see right through it, right? Now, have you ever imagined God being transparent? God looked like a jasper, the Bible says. And he's transparent. Because jasper is clear as what? Crystal. Now, what's fascinating about God is that he is made or clothed with light. He's clothed with light. Have you ever, as a child in a classroom, done the experiment of taking some kind of uh, stone or plastic or gem of some sort and shined a light into it, like a beam of light? What happens? when you hold even light up to it with that stone against a wall. What do you see? A prism. Yeah, I saw your hand go like that. You, you were thinking prism. <laughs> it's one of those. It's a prism of all kinds of light. Do you know that we can only see certain lights? We can only see that much infrared, or not quite infrared, and we can't see ultraviolets either. We, we see a little bit above and a little bit below those. We see a huge, vast array of colors. In fact, on the computer screen, there, there's millions of colors that you're looking at. I design, so I, I know that little bit of detail, but don't ask me much else about computers. I know how to use them, but I don't know how to create them, right? So you, you're looking at millions of colors, but we only see a certain part of those colors. John, what he saw was like a rainbow around the throne. Okay, so if God is made up of light, if he, we're going to look at some of those verses. If he's dressed in light, but he's also clear as jasper, no wonder John saw a rainbow round about the throne. There's a prism of God being shown all around him. A prism of light. Isn't that fascinating? So yeah, there's, there's this throne, and there's one sitting on him, that throne. And he was clear as crystal. And there was this light that was shining like a rainbow around him. Wow! Now, to me, that's fascinating. I hope that you go home and you sleep, before you go to sleep tonight, that you think about God sitting on the throne. And let me tell you, you're not even coming close to what it looks like. My Bible teaches that. No eye has seen no ear has heard, neither, neither has it come into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that what? Love him. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments, Jesus said. 
So let's look at a couple of verses. Jasper is clear as crystal, but if you go through and you find in Psalm 4, verse 6, I'll read these quickly. There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us. So the countenance of God is light. Okay, remember in chapter 1, when John saw Jesus, he turned around and said his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. <laughs> he was looking like at Jesus and looking as though he were looking at the sun. That's bright. Amen? Notice what Psalm 43, verse 3 says. I'm sorry, 44, verse 3. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand, O God, that's parenthetical, and thine arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. So again, the light of his countenance is referred to. Notice Psalm 89 and verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Again, the countenance, the shining forth of his presence. Psalm 90, verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before us, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. One more verse from the Psalms, or two in one reference. Psalm 104, verses 1 through 2. Notice this one, it's fascinating. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with two things, honor and majesty. Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. Who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. Isn't that amazing? Jesus Christ is, and God the Father, are covered with light. You clothe yourself with light as with a garment, it says. And so if God the Father is seated on the throne and he's clear as crystal, no wonder there's a prism of rainbow light being shined all the way around him. I want to be there and see that, don't you? Oh, I want to surrender to God 100% even right now to say, Lord, I want to see that throne, and I want to see the one seated on that throne. Because, you know, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, it actually says that we will see the face of God. Something more than even Moses himself couldn't have done. My Bible teaches in Exodus chapter 32 and 33 that uh, Moses said, hey, Lord, show me your glory. And he says, you can't see my face. I'll show you. I'll walk past you, and you can see from behind, but you can't see my face. Anybody who sees my face will what? Be destroyed. Consumed. Why? Because God is consuming fire to that which is contrary to his nature, sin. Now, the Bible talks about in verse 3 of Revelation 4, he that sat upon was to look upon like unto a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne like unto an emerald. The sardine stone is more like a reddish hue, okay, a sardine stone. There was a rainbow which embraces all the colors, colors that we can see, all the way from infrared to ultraviolet. And the throne is like unto an emerald, which we know that color, right, don't we? That's a greenish color. Well, emerald and uh, sardine stone, jasper, these were things that are interestingly found in the articles of clothing of the Old Testament priests. Okay, let's jump there real quick, and we'll see in Exodus 28. Exodus 28, the Bible teaches that there are clothing articles that the priests would wear, and these are something that actually contain the stones that are referred to. Look at Exodus 28, verses 15 through 20. We won't read that all there, but it says, Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work, after the work of the ephod shalt thou make it, of gold, blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be, doubled in a span. And then notice it says in verse 17, Thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, 
a topaz, carbuncle. I'm going to jump down quickly. Verse 18, emerald, sapphire, diamond. Verse um, 19, ligur, agate, amethyst, beryl. And it says the final last stone there in verse 20, jasper. So we saw that there's the sardin, the, or sardius, there's the emerald, and there's the jasper. Some of these stones that are pictured or highlighted when you're looking at God on the throne are some of the same colors from the gems that were on the ephod of the priest or the breastplate of the priest, you see? So again, there's the sanctuary language mixed in even with the colors that we're seeing in God. Now, Lucifer, one of the covering cherubs, we're, we're told in Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15, he had some of those same stones on him. Unfortunately, he, because of the beauty that he had, he was puffed up in pride. And as a result of being puffed up with the pride of his own beauty, he thought he should be on the throne instead of Christ and the Father on the throne. And that's what got us here in trouble. You follow that story down to the Garden of Eden, and then there was Adam, there was Eve, there was deceived Eve, and there was chosen to sin Adam, and they had children, and they had children, and that's what brought you here today. That's how it started with the stones, the beauty, these colors that were on Lucifer. Unfortunately, you can read about that story in both uh, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 as well. We won't go into that now for this point because we certainly have more to cover. But those same stones, some of them, are in the walls or the foundations of that holy city we read about earlier. These stones are going to be something we're going to be partaking of, holding, looking at, reflecting from, shining forth in, or how would you say, the light of that shining will be surrounding us when we're in heaven. I look forward to that. I used to do what's called rock geeking. You ever heard of rock geeking before? You're uh, involved in too many narcotics in Southern California, and you go out thinking you're going to find that precious stone that's going to bring you the money that you've always wanted. It's called rock geeking, and I did lots of it. I'd go and try to find all these amazing stones, and I found some cool ones, but nothing that brought me any money. So I wasted a lot of time. But notice what the Bible says in Revel... Uh, anyways, I was saying that because when we're in heaven, we're going to have access to all those stones. Amen? It's going to be beautiful. My house is going to be filled with those stones. I've got it kind of planned out, but what's funny is when I get up there, I'm going to say, ha, that's what I wanted? No way, I want that one. <laughs> the one that you gave me, God, that's the one I want because that's amazing. Look at this. And I want to invite you all to my house the very next day we're there. Amen? Amen. Meeting at my house in heaven, second day. <laughs> so, put that in your calendar if you don't mind. That'd be nice. Notice what it says in, in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Ha! Huh. So there's this throne. He sees the one on the throne. He tries to describe him using colors. He, saw, he talks about a rainbow, and God is clear like Jasper. <laughs> and then he says, around that throne, there's 24 thrones. And there are people on those thrones. They're all garbed in white, and they have crowns of gold on their head. Amazing. I wish I were an artist that could draw in 3D. I do a lot of computer work, but it just... Even the amazing things that can be done with special effects, whether it be After Effects and Photoshop and, and all these, these cool tricks, whether it be Blender or whatever, these are programs that you can use to make cool stuff. You can't touch it. You can't even touch it. Anytime I've ever tried to do anything illustrating Revelation chapter 4, ah, nope, I just quit. I'm not even going to show anybody because this is so lame compared to what I'm seeing in my mind. I'm not even going to show anybody for the embarrassment. But... There's 24 thrones, or seats. These are the same word for thrones. Oh, by the way, there's 12 times the word throne is translated. When it's seats, that's the same word but plural. 
That's not what I'm referring to. There's 12 times throne is translated. So what's happening here are a lot of things, okay? There's, there's a ton of information in verse 4. Around about the throne, there's 4 and 20 elders sitting. Well, there's, it's interesting, this 24 idea, okay? Uh, I'll refer to my notes, which are available, by the way, at revelationwithdaniel.com. You're going to click on the media section. You're going to go to Revelation with or Revelation verse by verse, I think it says, in the, the menu. And then that's where you'll be able to choose chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Well, in chapter 4, these are the notes. There's 24 thrones in this verse. There's 24 elders in this verse. There's 24 white garments in this verse. 24 crowns or wreaths of gold. Why do I say wreaths of gold? Well, you know, there are more types of crowns than just one. You see, there's, there's 24 crowns, but these are not kingly crowns. You can see kingly crowns in Revelation chapter 12. There's, and you, there are other places too, but that's just a refer, reference. In fact, I'll just tell you quickly, it's verse 3. You can see the kingly crowns or read about the crowns that are kingly. But if you look in the original Greek, these are not kingly crowns in chapter 4, verse 4. These are uh, garlands, if you will, or um, what's the term? I can't remember. I knew I would forget. I just, I'm going to call them wreaths of gold. Well, remember back in the cartoons where you had a Roman or a Grecian runner? He was victor, and he had that wreath around his head called a laurel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And they, they had that laurel on their head. That's what's being pictured here. It's a victory crown. Not a kingly crown, a victory crown. They have won the race. They have won. And therefore, they have these crowns of gold. Gold is an, another amazing color you can study on your own time, which is filled with, um, rather, the sanctuary in the Old Testament is filled with gold, the references and the materials. But these are golden crowns, and they're 24 elders that are dressed this way. I want you to take your Bible and go to 1 Chronicles in the Old Testament. 1 Chronicles 23. And we're going to see something about the, 20, the number 24 that is interesting. 1 Chronicles 23. And if I can get there, I will read starting in verses 2 through 3. The Bible says, He, that's David, gathered together all the princes of Israel with the priests and the Levites. Now the Levites were numbered from the age of 30 years and upward, and their number by their poles, man by man, was 38,000, verse 4, of which 20 and 4,000, so there's 24, 24,000 were set to, uh, forward to work of the house of the Lord, and 6,000 were officers and judges. But what's interesting is there's the 24,000 that were appointed to work for the ministry, for the sanctuary, if you will, for the ministry of God. Jump to 24, chapter 24, notice verse 5. Thus were they, the priests, the people that were gathered together, they were divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and governors of the house of God were the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar. And then it goes on and describes all the way that they were numbered. And you can read that they were brought into groups of 24. Notice verse 18. Three and twentieth to Deliah. The four and twentieth unto Maaziah. Verse 19. These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner, under Aaron their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. So under Aaron the father, there were supposed to be four sons, okay? These four sons were the sons of Aaron. And they were supposed to be the ones that organized these 24 groups, each with 24,000, you see? And so there's this number 24, interestingly, that comes up that's specifically designated for the purpose and ministry of the sanctuary. So, I said that there were supposed to be four sons, the sons of Aaron, but they weren't. Why weren't there? Notice 
in 1 Chronicles 27, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. This is what was supposed to be was four sons of Aaron. It says in verse 1, now the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, here they are, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Verse 2 explains what happened. But Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office. So they were supposed to be four sons. But two of those sons, Nadab and Abihu, were unfaithful in the priestly ministry. They drank, they got drunk, they thought they could use God's holy things as though it was common. And in Leviticus chapter 10, you can read the story, they offered sacred rather common fire for the sacred, God took him just like that. Very serious business. And so God, when he was organizing the father to have four sons and those four sons to organize 24 groups, and there was 24,000 in those groups divided up into, you know, all these set numbers, God had a purpose for that. Why? In Revelation chapter 4, I think we get a picture of it. There are some more references there in the notes, but... Go back to Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to see something fascinating in this chapter as we continue to study. But you're going to have to hold the thoughts of the 24,000 and the 24 under the 4 for just a moment. Okay? I'll refer to it again, but notice what it says there in chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 5. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I had a comment um, from one of the persons listening to this series earlier about Revelation chapter 1, where it was talking in regard to the seven lamps. The seven lamps are referred to in chapter 1 as the seven churches, okay? The seven lamps are the seven churches. Here, it explains further. The seven lamps are the seven spirits. And so you can only say that both of them mean the same thing. The church, empowered by the spirit on earth, is referred to as the seven lamps. Okay? So you have there one example in Revelation chapter 1 and another example in Revelation chapter 4 of what the seven lamps are. They are the seven churches filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word seven, of course, we know is the, co- the word completion or the fulfillment. The churches were given the full power of the Holy Spirit after it was given on the day of Pentecost, which is Revelation, um, Acts chapter 2. We're going to talk about that more next time. We're going to continue to build these stories and look into these things as we continue. But what it talks about in verse 5 is thunder. The seven lamps of God. Now, thunder, I wish it occurred, wait a minute, one, two, three. I think it's eight times. I don't remember right off the top of my head. I think it's eight times in the book of Revelation. It might be seven. I don't recall. I know there are seven verses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think it's eight times that it refers to the uh, thunders. But when you look at the book of Revelation, in regard to the thunders, if you study the word thunder, it seems as though, and this is just something that you're going to have to study for yourself, but it seems as though what's being portrayed is the presence of God himself. So God's presence is surrounded with thunder. His voice is like the sound of thunder as well. We can see that in, let's see, Matthew chapter 3. Remember when Jesus was baptized? The Holy Spirit came down like a dove, God the Father spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Some folk thought that that was thunder. You know what? Maybe that was another story when he spoke saying, This is my beloved Son. Reverence him or honor him. I don't remember exactly what it says there. But I think that's when people thought it was thunder, right? Am Am I, okay, somebody says yes. So I'm confusing that a little bit, but you can go ahead and study on your own. I believe the thunder is the presence of God in the book of Revelation. And we're going to, as we continue studying the book of Revelation, we're going to be seeing more clearly those specific portions of Revelation that uh, exemplify Christ's 
immediate presence or the presence of God there in those scenarios. So, <clears throat> the seven lamps are referred to in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. We're going to look at chapter 5 next time as we... Um, I'm sorry, the seven spirits are referred to, not the seven lamps. The seven spirits are referred to those four times in the book of Revelation. So that's what we read about in verse 5, is the thundering, the seven lamps being the seven spirits. They are before the throne. So now again, take your mind, go up into heaven through the sanctuary door. And now, I know you just took your mind and you went up into heaven through the sanctuary door, but you didn't do it well enough. Here's what I mean. Whatever you had in your mind, just expand it by a multitude of miles that way and a multitude of miles that way. And then take the ceiling and just make it vaulted as high as it would go. Expand that place as big as possible. You are in a huge auditorium, okay? When you speak, speak, speak. It echoes, all right? Why am I saying this? Well, guess what? Revelation chapter 5 says that there are 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels in that sanctuary. Daniel chapter 7 says the same thing. And these angels, they don't all just walk in line. They fly. So there's got to be fly space for them all. You see what I'm saying? So you've got to have high vaulted ceilings. You've got to have room enough for everybody to sit. You've got to have the throne of God with 24 thrones around it. And then you've got to have room for the seven lamps before them. You've got a huge place. And got, by the way, it's all gold. You thought your necklace was nice. You ain't got nothing compared to what's up there. I'll tell you, I look forward to being in heaven. What about you? It's going to be amazing, absolutely beautiful. So, when we're talking about heaven, let's look and see what else is there. Verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. Wait a minute, the sea of glass is like unto crystal? I thought God was jasper, which is clear as crystal. So, God looks like water? God looks like clear glass crystal? He looks, wow, right? It's amazing. Amazing that God is all colors. So, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the four beasts, or the first beast rather, was like a lion the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Notice what's happening here in this section. You have these, this throne with four beasts that are full of eyes before and behind. And they have four faces. Okay, The first like a lion, second like a calf, second, the third like a man, and the fourth like an eagle. <laughs> What's interesting is he's seeing very similar or similarly to what Ezekiel saw. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Turn in your Bible quickly to Ezekiel chapter 1 and you're going to see something here that is fascinating. It's verses 5 through 14. They moved Ezekiel on me. There it is. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to just skip through quickly. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, like a calf's foot, and they were burnished brass. Verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings. It says in verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They all went straight forward. Verse 10, as for the likeness of the faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. 
Isn't that amazing? So Ezekiel saw in vision the same thing that John is trying to describe in the book of Revelation in vision. I think it's amazing. Why? Because what's happening is they're both seeing heaven. They're both seeing the living beasts or the living creatures. The Revelation calls them the living beasts. Ezekiel calls them the living creatures. I like to think that they're living creatures, animals of some sort. They're different than the stuff that we see down here or else they would have been able to describe it, right? What's interesting is, is that God the Father has four that minister over the 24. Kind of like in the Old Testament where you have the father Aaron having four sons that are ministering over the 24 divisions. And so what I think we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, is a picture of the organized, orderly ministry of God the Father with his Son and the living creatures empowered by the Holy Spirit and the church is working together with the 24 divisions of ministering angels. Okay? Isn't that fascinating? So you have commanders. You have, you have order. You have structure in heaven. Why? To save your soul. To save my soul. To answer the prayers, as we'll learn in next chapter, of people like my mother. Just a quick testimony. I did not follow Christ for most of my young years up until 19. Okay? When I was young, she took me to church. I would fall asleep on purpose, or I would go out and I would do things in nature while she was in church. That was most of my time in my youth with my mother going to church. I didn't like it, didn't care for the people there. In fact, unfortunately, in the church that I was at, I felt the people weren't very nice. That didn't help me much. Well, so it happened that through my, my teenage years, I was into drinking, I was into drugs, I was going way too fast, way too far with too many people. And I ended up, at 19 years old, being shocked by the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you this story later sometime in detail. But I'm telling you, I was shocked by the Holy Spirit in answer to my mother's prayers. Nobody had witnessed to me. I didn't read a book. I didn't end up in church or go to a meeting and, and like, wow, I need God. It wasn't like that. It was like God just thumped me on the head while I was drunk, in fact, at one time sitting around this, this table with my friends. And it wasn't very much longer I was reading the Bible because I was hearing a voice in my head saying, go get your Bible. Go get your Bible. Why? Because my mother was praying. And that's what's happening in heaven right now. God with Christ, the Holy Spirit, the four living creatures, the 24 divisions or the 24 elders are all organized to reach out and save us and your children and those that are watching on video or those that are listening on the audio, the people that are in this room and anybody else who will get this in any kind of media. He wants to save us. Amen? That's what this is about. That's what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 4. And then it says in verse 7, if we haven't read that yet, we did. Verse 8. Oh, by the way, there's more in the notes about the living creatures. And uh, there's the four sons of Aaron referred to. And there's the, uh, I guess what I can just read is the last question here. Do the four living creatures of Revelation 4 coordinate and organize the 24 elders of the heavenly ministry? I think it seems like that since you're looking at the Old Testament. And then we're going to read, uh, just refer to in verse 7 again, the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. Okay? The lion, the man, the calf, the eagle. I have done this study. We're not going to take the time to go through it right now. But what if those four living creatures illustrated the four different characteristics or main characteristics that Christ wanted us to know about him? What if those four living creatures, the, um, the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle, are somewhat symbolically illustrated through the, diff the four different Gospels? What if the lion, the first living creature, is king of the forest, as we know the lion to be? One of the strongest, one of the loudest, one of the fastest. And what if the kingdom is a word that is used most often in Mark or Matthew compared to Mark, Luke, and John? 
Christ in Matthew talks about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. The kingdom of heaven has come unto you. The kingdom of heaven. My father in the kingdom. The angels are in the kingdom beholding my father's face. Kingdom is referred to in Matthew more than any other of the gospels. Well, guess what? The ox, the next uh, living creature, or the calf, this is a workhorse, isn't it? Excuse the denunciation for calling an ox a horse, but it's a work animal, a work beast. We know that in some of our Asian countries, for example, or in Africa. <clears throat> Mark talks about one miracle after another. The word immediately, immediately, immediately is talked about in the book of Mark. You're seeing that things are done right now, right away. Think miracles are happening. There's work being done. Well, the very next animal or creature is referred to as a man. And no other gospel illustrates the manhood of Christ more than the book of Luke. Where can you read about the boyhood of Christ in any other Matthew, Mark, or John? You can't read about it. Don't even know about it. In Luke, it covers it. In fact, it covers the genealogy all the way up. And then it talks about Christ as he's born, as he's circumcised, as he's a babe. Where do you find out about the story of Christ going uh, uh, into the temple? What about Christ going into the temple at 12 years old as well? All in Luke, the next gospel. So we have the lion, Matthew, the ox or the calf, Mark, the man, Luke, and an eagle. Uh, I know a lot of times people have said that the eagle can represent something divine. Well, I like to think that the eagle sees from a different perspective than anybody else. And I'll tell you, if you know the book of John, he saw with a different perspective than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. He saw the divinity of Christ in a way that is so beautiful compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, those aren't bad gospels. I'm just telling you that it's a very different gospel. The, the synonymous gospels are uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a whole other different story. It's not even one of the synonymous. Okay? It's, it's a different, or synoptic. That's, what, that's the word, synoptic. It's not the same. It's in a different category. See, so we have what we could look at. I'm not saying this is it, but we could see that there's the kingdom, the work of an ox, the manhood, and the different or higher divine perspective that were given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So perhaps the lion calf, the man, and the eagle could be referring to the characteristics of Christ portrayed in the Gospels. I'm not sure, I'm just saying. Now, the Bible says in verse 8, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. We read in Ezekiel that there was only four. And it says, they were full of eyes within, and they do not rest day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, or which was, which is, and which is to come. I have a bunch of references here in my Bible. I've got little notes to go to this verse and that verse and this verse. We don't have enough time for all of this, but I'm telling you, these living beings, full of eyes, eyes, by the way, uh, when you're talking about eyes in the Bible, you either have eyes like the eyes of a man, which is in Daniel chapter 8. We probably will take a look at that in this series through the book of Revelation. Or you have eyes like God's eyes. You can see in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 18 that you would be able to see with eyes that are of understanding. These eyes illustrate their ability to see. Okay? This could be referring partly to God's omnipresence, his ability to see everything, his omniscience, knowing all, okay? But what I want to notice here is they rest not, they do not stop praising God, saying, holy, holy, holy. And I like to think that this is not a boring experience for the four living creatures. And I think every time they mention holy, it's like, bear the very bad illustration, but it's like peeling another layer from an onion. There's another layer that's deeper, richer, more beautiful. When they say holy, there's 
a new revelation of holiness. So they say it again, holy, and another understanding, another thing they hadn't noticed before, another way of hearing it, another way of saying it, it comes out again. They say it the third time, holy. And it's just like holiness keeps flooding them and just infiltrating their minds and just consuming them with the beauty and the power, and they just keep saying it with deeper and more full revelation after revelation after revelation. And so when we're in heaven, it's not going to be that we're just going holy, holy, holy. <laughs> Holy, holy, no, no, no. We're going to be almost like tasting it, smelling it, feeling it. Holy, holy, holy. I want to be there, don't you? Amen. So, it says in verse 9, When those beasts, or living creatures, give glory and thanks to him the Father that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever. Notice verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and they worship him that lives forever and ever, casting their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy sake they are and were created. Now, they had created all things. He says they had created all things. They said he had created all things. God, in fact, did create all things. How? Through his Son. The Bible teaches this. Look in John chapter 1. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 1. We're going to have a very quick study in the creation in the New Testament. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, how many? All things were made by Him, and without Him, was not anything made that was made. Jump down to verse 14. And the Word, the one that was God in verse 1, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. So my question is, who is the Word that created all things? It's Jesus Christ. Look to your Bible, in your Bible, to Colossians chapter 1 as well. Colossians Chapter 1, and ver reading verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, which is who? Jesus. Even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? By the way, the firstborn in verse 18 is the firstborn from the dead. He wasn't the firstborn from the dead. He was the most prominent from the dead. So in verse 15, when it says the firstborn of every creature, the word firstborn is most prominent. So it says there in verse 16, For by him were all things created. Who? By Jesus, the one that we get forgiveness of sins through his blood. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then one more verse in Hebrews chapter 1 regarding the, the uh, creation abilities of Christ and what God did, God the Father did through Christ, was create the universe through him. Verse 1 of Hebrews 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers, unto the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So in Revelation chapter 4, at the end, the very last verse, it says, you created all things, and that is true. How did he do it? He created all things through his Son. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, it says it right there. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. By whom he, the Father, created all things. So, God the Father used Christ to create all things, even the worlds. 
So in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, yes, he did create all things, but it is God the Father who is seated on the throne. Why do we know that? How do we know that? Next time, we're going to be able to look at chapter 5, which describes another creature coming into this same throne room. It ends up being the Lamb, which is who? Jesus. So the next time we're together, we're going to be looking at that. But I wanted to just break down quickly some of the thoughts here in the book of Revelation. We have the picture of Christ in chapter 1. Then that's uh, followed by seven churches. Here, preparatory to the picture of Christ in chapter 5, we have the setting. God the Father has everything organized, ready and able to do ministry here on earth. And then comes the picture of Christ, which is going to be followed by seven seals. And then there's the picture of Christ in, in chapter 8, followed by seven trumpets. I want to read a verse that I penned a while ago. It's actually illustrating chapters 4 through 6. This is my poem that I called Revelation 4 through 6 in verse. Not a very creative title, but... Long ago on a bright blue stone sat the king of glory upon his throne. Rainbow colors were about his face, darkness or evil, not even a trace. His servants did sing with joy, love, and fullness. He astounded creation with all of his goodness. Then looked he for one to open the book. His voice roared like thunder. The universe shook. Not one, nowhere. So who could it be? I've looked above and below, but none could I see. I broke, I fell, I cried and I wept. When a lion, a lamb, exceptional, adept, he stood up in loneliness, beauty and power. With strength in his eyes, all evil would cower. He reached with his hand, torn with a hole, and took from the throne a most marvelous scroll, sealed with gems, jewels, and glittering gold, the law of love he's meant to uphold. So angels bore witness of his incredible journey through education and strife to become his attorney, our attorney. Then I stood before him with eyes transfixed while he pronounced his pardon with mercy unmixed. And still today, he opens those seals midst praises and honor and Ezekiel's wheels. So take a closer look. Come and behold. There's a book of life too. In it, be enrolled.